Good morning. I just love that quote. Every successful user is not just a number. It's a whole life, a whole new story. Thank you, Florian, Pranshu, Brett, and Oded for sharing those remarkable stories with us. And thank you to each one of you for building those apps and games that impact so many lives and write so many beautiful stories. Welcome to Playtime 2017. <laughs> Be it an app that helps you communicate better, get healthier, learn a language, or a game that provides pure entertainment or an avenue for self-expression or learning a new skill, your apps and games impact people who are on two billion Android devices. Just think about that for a moment. Amazing, isn't it? And if you see the stories that we just showed you, you realize that the connection between the app and the user goes way beyond, way beyond the technical features that it provides. We on Android and Play are humbled to provide a small part of that technology to make those connections possible. In addition to building great apps, you have told us that you want to support causes that matter to you. Today, I'm super excited to announce the first of those initiatives of supporting these causes. We have partnered with these developers to support World Food Day, a program that creates activism and brings attention to people who are suffering from hunger around the world. Throughout this week, we will promote these 11 apps and games, and 100% of the proceeds of a key item in those apps and games will be donated to the World Food Program. Give these developers a big hand. I would also ask each one of you, take off your phones, download these apps and games, play them, right? Thank you for your generosity. In the coming months, we look forward to working with more of you to find causes that matter to you and support more things with bigger social impact. So here we are, Playtime 2017. We were just talking about it four years ago. This was a tiny little program in a small little room on the Google campus. And today, you join a global series of events with hundreds of top developers across Berlin and Sao Paulo and Shenzhen and Singapore and uh, Seoul and Tokyo. You know, I can't even keep track of the places that this is happening and where we bring top developers together to learn what's latest at Google as well as from each other. So what's the day going to look like? We're going to kick off by talking to you about what's latest from Google in the morning. We also have IDEO coming up here and talking to us about building uh, apps and games using immersive technologies. In the afternoon, you will hear from each other about best practices about building great games, driving engagement, launching successfully, and keeping your user happy. Throughout this day, we are going to have one theme that will come up over and over again. And that is about sustainable engagement. As you listen to the tools that we are going to provide you to engage your users, I ask you to think about this theme and ponder on a few questions. What does sustainable engagement mean for you in your app or game? Are you seeing your users hitting capacity? What metrics are you using to know what engagement is good and maybe what isn't? How will we collectively build a happy user base for a long time? These are important questions for all of us in the industry because they have significant impact on our businesses, but also for our responsibility towards our users. And these are difficult questions. 
We hope to continue the dialogue we start here today to find answers for these questions. I speak for everyone on Google Play when I say I'm super excited that we have you all here today together. At the end of this day, I hope you will tell us that you heard something that excited you, and more importantly, that you met somebody who inspired you. And with that, let's kick off Playtime. I'm going to call on stage Vineet to talk about Google Play product vision. Uh, thanks, Purnima. Uh, hi, I'm Vineet Butch. I am responsible for the product team that uh, does the Play Store, the Play Console, as well as instant apps. So Google has been building uh, mobile platforms uh, for a while, obviously began with Android. We've expanded that now to cover everything from watches to TVs to cars. Play is the glue that binds these platforms together. It's what brings these platforms to life by delivering apps and games that our users want to actually really get benefit of these platforms. And at the same time, of course, uh, helping you, our developer partners, build meaningful, sustainable businesses on, on these platforms. So I'm going to walk you through some of the big things we're thinking about for the next year plus, And then uh, the leads from different parts of, uh, of play are going to dive into details uh, through the course of, of the morning. So um, we're very proud of the success that we've had in growing the store and growing the developer ecosystem. But with this growth, has, uh, that, that we definitely have faced some challenges. For the user, the challenge is that now there's you know, this 2 million plus apps and games. Which one should they use? Which one should they install, download, play with? And for you, for our developers, how do you get to the users who actually will care about your, your app? How do you actually get them to engage more deeply and to re-engage with an app they may have on their phone but may not even remember they have on their phone? And uh, if you've invested in building an app or game that really deeply pulls in the user, how do you get the benefit of that in terms of attracting new users? Well, we've been thinking a lot about all of these issues, and, and we've seen that the, for the store, browse traffic, that's people who come to the store and come to the home page and say, well, I'm bored, show me something. That's really grown. And so how do we help solve some of these problems? Well, one thing is that we should really, when we, in terms of our ranking, in terms of our personalization, we should really reward developers who've built apps and games that are deeply engaging. In the past, you know, we're Google, we use this kind of data, but We've used things like click data and install data, but we haven't until recently started using engagement data in our ranking, and now we are. So uh, normalized across categories, of course, we are leveraging things like, well, these, this app seems to engage users a lot more. We should probably rank it higher because it seems like it, it's, it, the user, users seem to like this more than the norm for this category. So using that kind of data, we invested a lot in building our personalization in the store. Uh, really, our mission is to, for the user to find a store that they feel is really tailored to themselves, that sort of speaks to them. Uh, we made big strides, uh, not quite all the way there yet, but we've definitely, when we look at our metrics around this, it, it's quite impressive how much we've been able to improve the, 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 fee, the user believing that this store is really tailored to, to them. Um, we're also uh, uh, trying to do a number of things around re-engaging users with the apps and games they already have. Uh, Kara will talk some more about this uh, uh, subsequently to this, but uh, in a nutshell, we've made new destinations for games. We've brought in things like uh, live event feeds into the store. Um, and, uh, uh, and in general, we're, we're, as we measure ourselves with new launches, we're thinking not just of new high quality installs, but also helping users rediscover something they already may have on their phone. Um, we, uh, we made a big announcement around the general availability uh, to developers of Android Instant Apps at I.O. This, uh, this past May. 
Uh, well, I'm very happy to say that uh, the store is now getting behind driving traffic to instant apps in a very big way. Uh, the first step, um, this is an experiment where, where we've launched recently. Uh, in addition to just being able to install an app, users will be able to try it with a simple one-button press, and you know, that's as though they already had the app. And in fact, the example you see here is the Share the Meal app that Purnima talked about. You know, clearly, you want, to, you want to spread some joy, you want to share, you want to sh uh, share some benefit, just click one button, boom, it's right there. It's no secret that uh, a lot of the growth for the Android ecosystem is happening in markets like India, Indonesia, Brazil. Lots of users, lots of new users. And also not surprising that many of these new users encounter their very first smartphone, which may actually be constrained in terms of memory, storage, and maybe on a somewhat bandwidth-constrained network. Uh, we are launching Android Go, uh, a streamlined version of Android, to be optimized for these kind of devices and networks, which is rolling out in the next couple of months. Um, we also uh, are going to make the store on in these markets uh, leaner, slimmer, etc. And uh, we're hoping to really present apps and games in these markets that are optimized for these conditions. Uh, we have for a while had uh, the next guidelines for building for, for these kinds of devices and users. Uh, a number of developers already adopted these. Um, we encourage you to take a look at these if you haven't yet and see how you can benefit from this, this user growth. Uh, in the store, we will, for users in, on these devices in these markets, be prioritizing uh, apps that are optimized for them. So, so if, for example, you've built a light app or if you've slimmed down your app, we will be making sure the user gets to see that um, as, as, as a high priority. So uh, in closing, I um, just want to say that uh, uh, through the course of today, uh, this afternoon, we'll have, uh, uh, we'll have product managers and developer relations teams from across different parts of, um, of, uh, of Google available for one-on-one -on -one sessions with you. Please take advantage of this. Um, the, the agenda will explain who's available when. Uh, but uh, definitely make sure that you come with your questions, with your thoughts, with your comments, and if you want to run ideas by us, we're here for you. Please take advantage of this. With that, uh, I'll ask Matt Henderson, who's our lead for the Play Console, to give you some more details about that. Lots of great stuff to share with you today. So, two billion devices, publishing software to two billion devices. It's a tremendous opportunity but it's also challenging. And so it's important that we build tools to help support your success. Play can help you iterate on your app to get it to high quality prior to release and post-release. During the release process, we can help you to mitigate risks that come up. Our tools can also help you to understand business opportunities and take advantage of those business opportunities. On the quality side, earlier this year at I.O., we announced Android Vitals in the Play Console. Android Vitals is a program to help you build apps and games of high quality. How important is quality? Well, 50% of one-star rated reviews on Play mention app stability and bugs. So if you want to avoid one-star rating reviews, this is a great thing to invest time in. We're really excited that just since I.O., Android Vitals has really been embraced. So already, 65% of top developers are using Android Vitals to help learn how they can improve their app quality. Vitals helps you understand three areas of bad user experience across stability, battery, and rendering. From today, five new metrics are launching in Vitals to help you understand problems more deeply. For app stability, Vitals now reports when the same user session is affected by multiple ANRs and crashes. These repeated problems cause user frustration, leading to risk of uninstall. For battery, Vitals now highlights when excessive activity takes place in the background. 
leading to unnecessary battery drain. For example, we now report excessive Wi-Fi scans and excessive network usage in the background, as well as stuck wake locks. Until now, Android Vitals has generated metrics from users on the Nexus and Pixel devices. Today, our coverage expands dramatically. It's up 25-fold from just earlier in the year. It's a huge increase and includes a spectrum of flagship devices and mid-range devices as well. We've also revamped the Android Vitals section in the Play Console with a richer user experience. There's an overview for metrics at a glance. There's time series charts. There's also benchmarks so you can compare your own metrics against the metrics of other developers as a whole. And as you improve your app quality, we want to make sure that end users find those great experiences. That's why Android Vitals are now a key signal for Google Play in a number of user-facing areas. Our search and discovery algorithms take Vitals into account when they favor apps with better Vitals. And Vitals are an important signal when your app is being considered for promotional opportunities like the new and updated collection, Editor's Choice Collection, the Google Play Awards, and the recently launched Android Excellence Program. The pre-launch report is a way to improve quality before the app's published. It automatically crawls and tests your APKs on a variety of different devices looking for crashes and security vulner vulnerabilities. And what we've observed is 90% of the time that the pre-launch report testing robot discovers crashes in an app, the developer chooses not to take that app forward into production. It's modified before going into production. So this is really working well at identifying problems that are then fixed before going out to real users. From today, every APK that's submitted to alpha and beta track is going to get a pre-launch report. So this is dramatically expanding the availability of the program. We're also launching a new robot tester that reaches deeper into the app and discovers more crashes, more problems. We're adding new performance metrics as well to the pre-launch report covering CPU, memory, network, and rendering. App security is another key part of a quality user experience. And Play's security team sends security recommendations to thousands of developers to help fix vulnerabilities. Today, we're further investing in security with the Google Play Security Reward Program. Here's how it works. To start with, we'll be inviting developers of popular apps to opt into the program. Participating security researchers will try to find vulnerabilities in those eligible apps. They submit the vulnerabilities in a report via your bug reporting process. And our partner, HackerOne, can set up a free reporting process if you don't already have one. Once the vulnerability is fixed, the researcher reports it to the Play Store, and the security reward program uh, will generate a reward, a payout from Google to that researcher. Google's security team will then scan all apps for that vulnerability and send security recommendations to any other affected developers. Some of Google's security team and some of the HackerOne team are here today. So if you want to uh, learn more, chat further with them, um, I encourage you to do so. So tools in the Play Console can also help you mitigate risks when you're targeting and releasing your app to your audience. Alpha and beta testing has been one of the features at Play that developers really love most. More than 300,000 developers use alpha and beta tracks. We've got some new capability that we're adding to that, country targeting at the track level. So until today, country targeting was fixed across all track states. But now you can beta test in specific countries. So you can beta test in country A before launching in that country publicly, even though your app may be fully launched in country B. 
In the coming weeks, we're going to be also launching country targeting in staged rollouts. So for a new release of an existing app, uh, you may use staged rollouts to uh, increase that release to specific percentages of, of production users. And with country targeting, you'll be able to control which countries that process is happening to over time. The device catalog was also a new feature we announced to I.O. this year. And it's been tremendously popular. So this is a tool where you can uh, search devices by attributes like RAM, system on chip, screen size, and more. It shows you your app's performance for specific devices, and you can set targeting rules if you want to exclude some devices if they're not suitable for your app. We're now launching a new feature that allows you to save device search queries. So if you have a combination of filter settings that have perhaps uh, gets you large screen devices that are running Android O and meet a certain bar for RAM size, um, then you can save that as a custom query and use it again in the future and more, more quickly navigate to it in the future. Another cool feature we're adding here uh, is based off questions that we receive from developers often, which is, uh, why isn't this specific device supported by my app? So in the device catalog, uh, we're launching today a feature where we answer that exact question. You can pick a specific device in the device catalog, and it will tell you reasons why your app doesn't support that device. For example, on, on the screen here, uh, the uh, production APK requires accelerometer feature, and the beta APK uh, requires the camera autofocus feature, which this device doesn't support. Um, so you can go into the device catalog and find those sorts of reasons to help you understand what's going on. We continue to add features to the Play Console to help you grow your business. And subscriptions are the fastest growing developer business model. We have new features to help with that. So easier setup means you can launch your subscription app faster. We recently announced uh, the official release of the Play Billing Library. And uh, this simplifies the development process for Google Play Billing by making sure that you're always using the latest in-app billing features. We're making it easier for you to test your payment flows by providing a good form of payment and a bad form of payment for each license test account. So you can test without having to use a real payment method. We're also updating the subscription settings in the Play Console so you can configure uh, your subscription SKUs at an app level. Now, your business can't survive if you don't get users. Our research has shown that 78% of subscribers start with a free experience. So we're introducing improvements to our free trial logic to make it smarter. In order to reduce free trial abuse, we're now enforcing the user's one free trial at the app level. And you can manage that setting uh, in the new subscription setting page on, uh, on the Play Console. This setting is available today, and enforcement is going to start in December this year. We've heard feedback from developers that some of you would like to have shorter free trial lengths. So now the minimum free trial length will be three days. For those of you with content costs, this lowers the marginal cost of acquisition. While acquiring users is important, you can't stay in business long if you don't keep them. At I.O., we talked about a new feature called Account Hold. And I'm pleased to announce that it's now open for general availability and can be implemented by checking the Account Hold box in the subscription setting in Play Console. We're also launching a new WinBack features. So starting today, we're going to notify you uh, immediately when a subscriber state change including cancellation. So no more waiting until the end of the month to check the API and find out that a subscriber canceled two weeks ago. Instead, you can understand immediately and, and trigger communication to the user, uh, especially if there's something, something new that may entice them to retain the subscription. Um, maybe they didn't know about a new feature. Maybe they didn't know about a new show that you had just launched. And so these win-back features, we think, can help you to increase user retention. Also, starting today, 
We're giving users the ability to restore a subscription that uh, hasn't completely subscribed, it hasn't completely expires. So they had a subscription, they unsubscribed, but uh, they have the ability to restore that with, without going through this, the whole subscription creation funnel again. And we think that's going to remove uh, some of the friction for them to get started and remain uh, in, in the relationship in the app. You can opt into that uh, subscription restoration setting through the new subscription settings in the Play Console as well. So lots of stuff. We hope the new features help as you continue to build amazing apps and games. And Kara is now going to share some news about the Play Store. Thanks. Um, before I get started, I first of all wanted to say a big thank you to all of you for the very, very hard work you do in day in, day out, in creating really great user experiences. It makes my job easier, uh, but most importantly, it really enables us to really deliver great content that creates user experiences um, across our users. So today I'm going to talk about some changes we've made on the Play Store to really make it easier for users to discover and to engage with our great content. So as Vineet mentioned, Play's mission is to bring devices to life on mobile and beyond. Whether for your phone, watch, or even your car, Play is a thread that connects two billion devices to content that makes them truly magical. Now, personalization here is the building block that's made even more powerful by having great content to recommend and great surfaces for those recommendations. I want to share with you some of the way that we've improved recommendations, uh, sorry, improved our personalization over the last year, as well as walk through some of the ways that we're creating new experiences to give users a much better way to engage with the content in the Play Store. So a lot of the magic of Play's recommendations happens behind the scenes. So I want to pull back the curtain a little and give you some insight into how we match the, great con the right content to the right user. To help users explore, we've built a taxonomy that really creates thousands and thousands of topics that enables a user to go much deeper into content and also gives the user more control. We've used this, as you'll see here, in the recently launched search refinements, where a user can make choices in delving down into the content that's of interest to them. We've also used this to power really great recommendations across our home pages. We've also improved our ranking to make it more contextually relevant and also much fresher. So for example, for a football fan here on the right, we know that that person is interested in football, and so we surface this content much more prominently in the store, given that user's interests as well as the fact that it's a trending topic. Across all our efforts, as you heard from both Pernima and Vineet, we really are thinking about ongoing engagement and re-engagement. And so you'll see here our Don't Forget to Try, which surfaces apps that a user has recently installed. So within our recommendations, we want to also help users to decide what to install. There's so many things, but what should they really install? So we want to highlight the best of the catalog. So we've always had editorial curation at play, but it's not always been clear to a user what's editorial versus other recommendations and why we're highlighting it to them. So a major focus of this year has been on creating new editorial experiences, including rich, long-form content, as you'll see here, which shows to users the reasons why we love this. Three great reasons why we think this is a great app or game a user should engage with. This editor's choice is now live in 17 countries around the world. 
and in future we'll be integrating this not just in its own section, but it'll be integrated in other parts of the Play Store to really help users throughout their discovery experience. So a large part of editorial is Play having an opinion about what's best for users. And so we'll be using these richer content experiences to highlight the best content um, that we have in our events, such as Best of Play. We really want to be able to recognize and reward you as developers who create this great content. And there is a spot here coming up later this year where you'll see our Best of Play 2017. So we also want to recognize those that take full advantage of the Android platform through programs like Android Excellence, which you'll see here on the right. You know, this will be refreshed each quarter, and you can reach out to your BD team um, for any further information. So we know how important games are to our users, and I want to share several changes we're making on the Play Store to really create a much more engaging browse experience, one that really does bring users back continually to the store to engage and re-engage with our great content. So let's start with navigation. Now, I know it's very obvious, but games are different from apps. And so we're reflecting that in elevating games to its own destination. Now, we do hope that that and expect that that will help drive more users into games to discover that great content. But it also provides an excellent foundation for creating experiences that are really unique to games, such as immersive recommendations that highlight videos, screenshots of actual gameplay. We also want to give users more control over how they browse that game's experience. So an example here is we've created a premium section within games that highlights paid, paid games. And this launched, it launched last month. This is also great for showcasing games on sale using the new strike through price feature that really enables a user to see the value uh, that you're delivering. To date, given this has launched a month, we're seeing really great engagement where users are going much further and deeper into the content and really engaging with many more of our premium games. Newness is really important to our gamers, and so, this is a topic that we're approaching in a few different ways. Similarly to premium games, we're creating, we're experimenting with a new section on new games. So this highlights some of our best new games across our popular franchises, as well as our amazing indies. We're also exposing pre-registration in many more places through the store, as well as much more prominently. So we do hope that this will give users a sense of what's coming up soon and enable you as developers to build momentum behind a new game launch. You'll see here also that another example of an experiment that we're, that we're doing is experimenting with pre-registration rewards. And this is shown on the store listing page with the example of um, our Angry Birds match. Again, we look out for more of these things in, that are coming up in the next few months and into 2018. And finally, we are also making our top charts more responsive. So we'll be updating them multiple times each day to ensure that we really are bringing freshness and newness to the store. But as Panama and Vineet both touched on, the store really does need to do much more than just help users find a new game or app to install. We really want to create and are working to create a destination for users to find out what's happening in the games that they already play. So here you'll see we've started highlighting major in-game events through store featuring. 
And these have had a great reaction from users who are really engaging and re-engaging, as well as producing great results for developers. So you'll start to see many more live ops through the store in different parts of the store um, coming up and into 2018. You'll see an example of this is the live ops card on Games Home which highlights exciting events happening in the games that a user is playing or has installed. And this encourages that user to really get back into the content and, and really make sure that they don't miss out. And lastly, we also want to make sure through Don't Forget to Play that we're creating every opportunity to recommend and ensure users are engaging with the content um, that they're interested in. So that was a lot on games, but what about apps? We're also looking to drive ongoing engagement with apps by really ensuring that users can get the most out of the apps that they already have. Starting with entertainment, um, we're taking a much more content-forward approach, which you can expect to see more of across other categories in future. So here's an example um, of what we mean in practice. So we're able to use the information about the content in each app to power a better search experience. So in this case, a user is interested in Game of Thrones. Now, while that user might be looking for an app or a game related to Game of Thrones, we know that they're probably looking to watch the show. So in this case, we can surface the HBO Go app and the HBO Now app and make it clear to users that they can stream and watch Game of Thrones through both of those apps. We've also started to highlight major in-app content moments through store featuring and we're experimenting with other dedicated surfaces through the store to surface these content moments. So this is an example here, working in partnership with HBO Now to surface um, many of the different shows where we make it clear to users that you can either, um, it, you can either uh, subscribe to the app or you can purchase the episodes. So again, giving users multiple ways to engage with the content that they're interested in. So as Vineet said, continuing with the theme about the store being about more than just installs, we're really excited to announce the first integration with Android Instant Apps within the Play Store. You can see here the Try Now button, which really encourages users to jump right into the content. This addresses users immediately right in the moment. We will be experimenting with different ways to surface this to users, so expect, more to see, expect to see more on this next year. So that was quite a lot, um, but I'm really excited about the new experiences that we're creating and the new content types that we're developing. You know, this gives new ways of, this gives users new ways to explore the catalog and gives them lots more reasons to come back to the store and continue to explore the store along the theme of continued engagement, ongoing engagement, and obviously re-engagement. Expect to see a lot more on that in 2018. So now over to Shahid, who's going to talk about Chrome. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Shahid. I'm a product manager on the Chrome OS team. Um, before I jump into what we're going to talk a little bit about today, can I just ask how many of you are familiar with Chrome OS, maybe used it? How many of you have a Chromebook? OK, awesome. So thank you for uh, uh, using it, trying it. Uh, we're um, very excited to be here at Playtime. And what we wanted to do was share with you a little bit of an introduction uh, to Chrome OS and um, how apps can work on that platform. So um, for those of you who are maybe a little less familiar, let me maybe start with some of the basics. 
So Chrome OS, uh, since we started building a product, has been about these three things, speed, simplicity, and security. We want Chrome OS to be a fast operating system, fast to start, fast to use. We want it to be simple, easy to use, that we think of Chrome OS like a tool that just disappears and lets you, as a user, get on with whatever you were there to do. And we want it to be secure. Um, that's been core to the way we've built Chrome OS ever since we first started. So that idea, or that set of uh, ideas, which has been very constant, has led us to some success. So Chromebook shipments overtook Macs in the United States um, last year. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Chrome OS, we're very strong in the education space. So Chromebooks actually outsell every other device combined in education. Uh, but it's not only in that education space where we're growing and getting stronger. Uh, we've seen nearly 20% year-on-year growth in retail, and we'll be continuing to invest in the success of Chromebooks uh, across the company um, the end of this year and over the next few years. So um, the Chrome OS team is new here at Playtime because the Play Store is fairly new to Chrome OS. So last year at I.O., we announced the availability of Google Play on Chrome OS, and we've been working, uh, working hard to improve how Play and Android apps work on Chrome OS. Um, so uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, we uh, worked with our uh, colleagues in the Google hardware team on the launch of the new Google Pixel Book. And the Pixel Book is really a, um, a sort of next step in the evolution of the Play Store on Chrome OS. And we feel the quality of the experience and the quality of the apps that are running on it is good. But it's not just Chrome OS when we think about Android apps running on the desktop. Chrome OS is, is uh, what we do, but also we work very closely with teams like the Samsung team who have Dex built into their product. So we're expecting to see more and more of that desktop projection uh, activity running on mobile. And that is very, very similar. Essentially, Android apps running inside a desktop environment. So that's some of the reasons why we think this is important um, for developers. The types of apps, though, can be different. So for me personally, when I use apps on my mobile phone, I tend to use it in short bursts. And when I pay for apps on mobile, uh, I tend to spend just a few dollars. But on desktop, the kinds of apps that I'll use, I will use hours at a time, often many hours at a time. And I'm happy to spend up to a few hundred dollars, because often the usage is professional in nature. So these really simple changes in the form factor, going to a bigger screen, getting faster inputs with mouse and keyboard, drive a different kind of usage. And that's been reflected in our analytics when we look at how people are using apps on these two platforms. So immersive apps like Skype, SimCity, AutoCAD 360, uh, our analytics tell us that users spend more time in that app on a Chromebook than they do on a smartphone, because the type of usage can be different. So now that we've talked a little bit about the why, um, what I'd like to do is share with you briefly some thoughts on uh, how you can help optimize your app so it runs really well inside, Android, inside a, a desktop operating system like Chrome OS. So first of all, Chromebooks work like any other Android device. If you have an app in the Google Play Store, it probably already works on Chrome OS. And for those of you who have Chrome OS devices, I hope you've had a chance to go into the Play Store on those devices and check out your apps running there already. Many developers, uh, understandably, focus their testing on mobile devices. Uh, so once you see it running on a big screen uh, on, in a laptop form factor, often uh, the need for optimization becomes immediately apparent. So the best uh, piece of advice I could share there is just try it. That said, we've worked with many, uh, many of you and many other developers to do those optimizations. And we found that uh, some of the questions uh, come down to these four differences between mobile and desktop. First one of those is wider screens. And it's probably the most common issue. So some apps don't use real estate like they should on a wider screen. So this is stuff that we need to do too. Uh, this is an older version of uh, Google Maps. The new version fixes this problem. So as you can see, um, the content is sort of locked in this uh, column in the middle of the screen. 
Um, and there's all of this space on the, the sides of the screen that isn't really being used. And here's another example. This is a conversation from Google Hangouts. So um, in this example, if it's on mobile, everything flows kind of neatly down the middle of the screen. And as you read down the conversation, you can go from bubble to bubble. But in the case of a wider screen, the two sides of the conversation are hard panned left and right. So the eye has to scan from one side to the other, to the other, to the other. And it makes it a little bit awkward. And this is the, exactly the kind of thing that just becomes immediately apparent once you see it running on a larger screen. The second note is that phones are default portrait, while laptops are default landscape. So uh, this is an example. This is uh, a game called uh, Stormfall, Rise of Balor. Um, and it's built for portrait. Chrome OS respects that setting, so you're not at your laptop and looking at it like this. So we do orient in the, in the correct uh, direction. But this is a case where it's a, a rich, a graphics-rich game. You have all this beautiful content in the middle of the screen, um, but these black bars on the side of it. Now, we know that fixing this kind of thing is non-trivial. Um, but we wanted to share another example. Uh, we've uh, worked with uh, this team. This is the Bubble Witch Saga uh, 3 game. So this is a game where the action is happening in a vertical space. For those of you who've played this game, sort of shoot these balls up uh, to catch balls at the top of the same color. And the action's happening in that vertical strip. So what would you put on the sides? Um, so this is an example of how uh, this team has worked uh, with our team uh, to find a good solution for making sure that that sort of graphical richness is spread a little bit towards the sides of the screen. The third thing that's different is windowing. So uh, Chrome OS, like most desktop operating systems, has a windowing system because multitasking is part of the benefit of doing that. Now, many apps uh, assume that the window size equals the display size, which makes complete sense on a regular mobile Android device. But that's not always the case. Even sometimes on Android, where you can do sort of split screen controls on uh, sort of newer Android releases. But part of the value of, of desktop is multitasking. And, and in this case, uh, the window size probably doesn't equal the display size. So apps need to understand that. So when an input is coming into the app, if the input is being read with respect to the display size and the output is being pushed out with respect to the app's position, that can create input offset errors. So that's just an example of uh, some of the kinds of things to watch out for um, because of the windowing system. So just being careful to, uh, to read um, and ensure that input and output are being coordinated with the current with um, respect to the same uh, artifact, that will help eliminate those kinds of errors. So finally, uh, keyboard, pointer, and stylus input, which on desktop machines uh, enables a user to be able to input information much, much faster. So there's lots of common states here that are kind of uncommon on mobile. So for example, hover states. I see a tooltip within an app. It's an, uh, sorry, I see an icon within an app. And I want to know what that does. I can hover over it and get a tooltip on desktop, which helps me understand what it does before I have to click on it. So obviously, that's, just, that's kind of an uncommon interaction. Uh, another example is swiping to dismiss. That's really common on mobile and very natural. So you're in an email app uh, or a, a reminders app, for example, and I swipe away to dismiss. On desktop, that's kind of weird, because you have to select it and drag it to the side with a mouse or a touchpad. So understanding how the usage patterns change as you go from one form factor to another will help uh, developers build an app, will help you build an app that works in both of these cases. And those updates can be really simple. So um, this is Slack. We worked closely with the Slack team on ensuring that app works really well on Chrome OS. So uh, if you're in Slack and you want to send a message, um, originally, um, before we, we went down the path of working with them, you would enter a message inside the app running on Chrome OS and uh, hit Enter here, and it would do, give you a carriage return. So simple change. Hitting Enter here now sends the message. It just helps that app behave a little bit more like what you would expect a desktop app to do. And lots of simple changes can add up to a much better user experience. So 
as I mentioned, and, and you've seen a couple of examples, many, uh, we've been working with many app developers to implement these. Uh, a couple I wanted to highlight. Um, so on the left here is uh, Squid. Um, so this is a, a note-taking uh, app and a drawing app. Um, they are taking advantage of a, an, a, an additional new API that we've built into Chrome OS. Super low latency, uh, uh, down to just 10 milliseconds. Uh, that's where you can get down to. And that makes writing and drawing feel much more natural. So many, many apps in the, in the Play Store who um, can take advantage of this and stylus inputs are working with us on uh, uh, ensuring that they can take advantage of this super low latency. But also adding keyboard controls uh, to games like, um, in this case, Star Wars uh, Galaxy of Heroes so that users can feel a little more immersed in the action uh, when they're running this on desktop. Those are just a couple. Uh, there are many, many more teams that we've been working with. Uh, for those of you who are here from those teams, thank you. We hope to work with you more. Um, and, uh, uh, and for those of you who we haven't talked to yet, we'll look forward to talking with you a little bit more. So ongoing, we want to do whatever we can to highlight great apps that work on Chrome OS. Uh, we did this at the launch of uh, the Pixelbook, where we highlighted uh, a number of apps uh, in demos to press, et cetera. Um, but there's lots more that we want to do. Uh, we want to show people the best of uh, the apps that are available in Play on Chrome OS. Uh, features on Play, um, in-store demos, uh, websites, press review kits, preloads, and much, much more. Um, so uh, we would love for you to come and chat with us in the classroom at 2 p.m. Uh, we'd love to work with many of you that we are working with more. We'd love to work with many of you that we aren't yet. Um, so please come and chat to us at 2 p.m., and we'll, we'd love to discuss with you some more. So with that, I'd like to hand you over to Nathan, um, PM on our developer platform for Daydream. Thank you. I'm Nathan. It's uh, awesome to be here. And I think it's safe to say that over the last decade, phones have become dramatically more powerful, right? The phones that we have today have bigger, higher resolution screens, faster CPUs and GPUs, more memory and storage than they had a decade ago. But one thing that hasn't changed very much at all is the sensors on the devices themselves. Right? Uh, we have GPS, cameras, accelerometers today, and we had those a decade ago. And if you think about it, these sensors are fundamentally how the phone understands its place in the world. And because they haven't changed a lot, I'm excited to talk about how they're about to change in what we're calling uh, augmented reality. And if you're not familiar with it, augmented reality is basically a synthesis of advancements in computer vision with these incredibly powerful computing platforms we all carry around in our pockets. And what augmented reality does is it allows the phone to synthesize information about the world and actually compute the precise position and orientation of that device, understand the world around it, and allow you, the developer, to actually integrate digital information in the context of real world objects, which is exactly where it's the most accessible and useful. And augmented reality is going to let us do incredible th new things on our phones. For example, you can shop for furniture without ever leaving your home. You can browse the world's largest warehouse of couches. You can pick one that you want, place it in your room, and see it in exactly the right scale, in exactly the right proportions, lit by the real light from the real window in the real world. Because augmented reality allows us to understand the objects in the world, we can actually learn about them and interact with them through augmented reality. So you can finally actually make a good cup of coffee on that office espresso machine that you've always wondered about. Uh, of course, augmented reality is going to be great for gaming and communication. Augmented reality will allow us to play, have fun, express our personalities in totally new world, in totally new ways, and blur the difference between our digital selves and our real selves. And of course, because augmented reality allows the phone to understand the world in so much greater precision, it's going to allow us to navigate the world indoors and out in ways that have never been possible before. Of course, uh, this is something we have actually a lot of experience with at Google. We've been doing AR since 2014 uh, through what was called Project Tango. 
And if you're not familiar with it, Tango was a hardware program that enhanced certain phones with new AR-specific sensors. And through Tango, we learned an incredible amount about like, what it takes to run uh, and create compelling smartphone AR experiences on Android. The challenge for us, though, of course, is that, as, as you can imagine, this requirement of a custom sensor suite limited the rate that we could scale the Tango-specific ecosystem. And one of the things that we're, of course, most proud about at Google is that today, Android is the world's most popular mobile computing platform with over 2 billion users. And so what I want to talk to you about today is how we're bringing augmented reality to the world at Android scale. It's a brand new technology uh, just released a couple months ago called AR Core. And essentially what AR Core is, it's an adaptation of the core innovations and algorithms from Tango, but all implemented in software so that they can run on commodity Android phones without any modification whatsoever. And as a developer, AR Core is going to give you three powerful foundational technologies. Uh, the first of which is called motion tracking. And this is what actually computes the position and orientation of the phone and updates it over time. So you can place a virtual object, look at it, walk around it, get closer, move back, and have that object feel like it's actually stationed in the real world, just like the scarecrow on the screen. But of course, in order to place you know, that virtual object, you need to understand the geometry of the world. So we have a second technology called environmental understanding. And what environmental understanding does is it looks at the 3D structure of the world and synthesizes that for you into identifying major features like the plane of the ground or the stage. Lastly, though, we want to understand not just the atoms of the world, but the photons of the world as well. We want to understand the illumination of our scenes so that you can actually capture the ambient lighting, apply it to digital objects as they feel married into the scene, and can even react to changes in illumination like our friend the Cowardly Lion here on the video. So AR Core uh, works on qualified devices running Android N and, uh, and above. Uh, today, we're in what's called a developer preview. So we've limited AR Core to specific phones. That's the Pixel, Pixel 2, Pixel XL, and Pi Pixel 2 XL, and the Samsung Galaxy S8. But we're going to be exiting the developer preview very soon. And when we do, later this winter, AR Core is going to run on 100 million Android devices. And we're partnering with the entire Android ecosystem to scale that number aggressively next year and beyond which is an incredible amount of scale for a brand new technology. So uh, if you're a developer, of course, you want to use this stuff and actually get started. So we have great SDKs for Android Studio, Unity, and Unreal. These are native, easy to use, high performance APIs. So whether you're a game developer or a native app developer, you can actually get started building for AR Core today. Uh, of course, at Google, we care a lot uh, about the web. It's deep in our DNA. And we believe that ultimately, the web is going to be part of bringing AR to everyone. And so we're investing, actually, in web AR standards uh, and br prototype browsers that allow web developers to eventually have the same capabilities as all of you native app developers have today. One thing I want to bring up, uh, it's really important. All of you are here because you've built amazing apps and great businesses on top of them. And I'm sure as you hear about a new technology, especially something that involves 3D like AR, you're thinking, you know, do I have to like, start from scratch? Do I have to build a brand new app to take advantage of AR? And I'm very happy to say that, no, you actually don't have to do that. Uh, one of the things that's amazing about and great about AR and has been a design criteria for our AR SDKs is that we want to make sure that you can actually add AR as an enhancement to the apps that you've already built uh, and have users engaging with. So of course, for some of you, you may see AR as an opportunity to start a brand new business, a brand new kind of app. But for the rest of you, you can create a AR like a new feature, like a new capability added to your app. Uh, and if that's if you're a Unity developer, use our Unity SDK. Native in Android Studio, we've got you covered, uh, and Unreal as well. So for all of you, you can add augmented reality to your existing app exactly where it matters most. And then when, it's, when you're ready to do something else, move on to a different capability or part of your user flow. You know, I'm personally incredibly excited about this new technology, how it's going to allow our phones to understand the world, the way it's going to let us as developers integrate and enhance our understanding 
of the user and the world with our display of it. Um, but if you're still a little bit skeptical, we've got a fun video that hopefully uh, convinces you that this is pretty awesome. So let's roll the video. <laughs> Thanks. And anyway, if you're interested in building for AR Core, uh, please check out developers.google.com slash AR. It's got links to documentation, getting started, downloads for our SDKs, a ton more. Uh, or, of course, if you're here, uh, come check out our classroom on VR and AR later this afternoon uh, just across the hall. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, we're going to take a quick 10-minute break, and we'll see you back here afterwards. Thank you so much. <laughs>